Hi, and welcome to History Makers TV. I'm Matt Prater. Today we're speaking with a history maker by the name of Cole Stringer. Welcome to the show. How are you, mate? <laughs> good on you, Matt. <laughs> How are you? Very good. <laughs> now, uh, for those who don't know Cole Stringer, he's an author, he's a speaker, he's been a pastor, and a uh, bit of a larrikin, uh, to be honest. But uh, <laughs> let, let's find out a bit of your story, Cole. Uh, whereabouts were you raised? And uh, tell us about your faith journey. I was born in South Australia, in a, uh, really on a farm. I mean, a real small real small town mm -hmm. and uh, you know I just grew up in the country like most other kids and I, I didn't come from a Christian background mm -hmm. although my grandmother I found later was born again mm -hmm. but I didn't know that so uh, just cars and shooting and girls and football and booze yeah. I guess like everybody else that's what <laughs> you sort of didn't know never heard the gospel till I was married and had kids okay I mean you know it's it's amazing that you can grow up even in a town where there's churches, but just heard religion, good, do good, get good, do bad, get bad. <laughs> One of my friends was in ministry, uh, used to come visit me at a sporting goods store. I mean, he'd come with a turned back collar, cross hanging around his neck you could anchor the Queen Mary to, but <laughs> never heard the gospel. Never ever heard the gospel until uh, we were married with kids. So how did you first hear it? Um, my wife's parents, a uh, German family, uh, they got saved and started the Bible study in their home, would you believe? Mm -hmm. A man called Geoffrey Bingham, a born again Anglican, he in charge of the Bible school in Adelaide. And so they invited us to come along. Well, when your parents in, or in laws invite you, you can't really say no. Yeah. We knew nothing, but we're going to straighten them out, you know. Mm -hmm. So we went along and uh, heard the gospel for the first time the gospel of grace, mm. the, good, the goodness of God. Mm. And Jen and I both accepted Jesus as Lord, and that's 40 odd years ago. Never looked back, never wanted to go back nothing to go back to. The day I got saved, the day, I was almost an alcoholic. I gave up drinking because guzzling was quicker. But I almost, to the, uh, the day I got saved, lost all desire for booze, just like really? that. And that's a miracle in itself. Mm. Never ever had the slightest desire for it again. Now, you ended up pastoring a church, uh, was it in Darwin? Was in it? Darwin, yeah. yes sir. How'd you get in, involved in that one? Uh, we moved to Darwin um, in the late 60s. I was, went up for three months to manage a gun shop, 27 years later. <laughs> and so uh, we uh, had a gun shop in Darwin and great, loved it. But um, we, we were saved, but I never had the slightest intention to ever be in ministry. And uh, somewhere along the line, we joined the Pentecostals, <laughs> the Charismaniacs. <laughs> and and uh, I, I'll never forget the first time. <laughs> first, First time I went along to the church there, like, you know, everybody's a missionary. Odd. <laughs> <laughs> they got close. Yeah, I'll never forget it, Matt. What do you do? I'm a missionary. What do you do? I, uh, I'm a school teacher. They said, what do you do? I said, I sell guns. <laughs> they looked at me like I had 666 tattered on me behind. <laughs> you do what? You sell guns. And I'll never forget that. We have so feminized the church. I feel the love's going to come right about now. We got, we got Jesus mixed up with Mother Teresa somewhere, you know, gentle Jesus speaking more. <laughs> Same Jesus drove the money changers out of the temple with a whip. True. Anybody that can separate a Jew from his money is no wimp. <laughs> That's exactly so. right. And, uh, you know, it's, it was a culture shock to me. I, I can understand why it's, you know, uh, the mosque full of men, the synagogue's full of men, the church is full of women. I, I'm not anti-woman. My wife's one, my mum's one. <laughs> but somewhere along the line, you know, we're not meeting a challenge for men. Mm. And I, I just do a lot in the outback and you can get men to some meetings, but sometimes it's hard to get them to church. Mm. And you've written a book about My manhood. Husband. What's that one called? Uh, Rediscovering Manhood. Mm -hmm. And you do conferences, you speak I, I, at I men's, men's conferences about that. What's the message that you bring to blokes? Well, every ancient culture, boys become men at 13. Uh, Jews, uh, bar mitzvah. Paul writes, when I was a child, I thought as a child, acted as a child, but when I become a man, not a teenager. Mm. Every ancient culture, there's no such thing as teenager. Mm. Aboriginal boys become men at puberty, same 13. North American Indians, Maasai, Maoris, whatever. Only Western society has a thing called teenager because we don't even know what a bloke is anymore. Mm. I feel love's going to come now. <laughs> so we ha if you don't know when you became a man, how do you know if you ever became one? See, I know as a husband because I went through a ceremony. You know, I remember the day I stood before the man of God, do you take this woman to be your lawful wedded wife? Well, you don't say, I'll give it a thought for a while, mate. You say, I do. Mm. Well, you get a bunch of fives up the hood. <laughs> but so the moment you say it, not, not when you sign, uh, you're in ministry, the moment you actually say it, mm. you're no longer single, you're a, you're a husband. Yeah. 
So I may not be a mature one, but I am one because I can point to a specific time in my life where I stopped being single and I became a man. Mm. Unless you're a Jew, Aboriginal, there's not a bloke in this country who knows when he became a man. Mm. So we, we have these things like when I could ride a motorbike, when I had my first beer, you could be a big boy and do all that. But the Bible talks about the difference between, I really believe, childhood and manhood is the acceptance of responsibility that goes with being a man. Mm. Just because you're born a male doesn't make you a man any more than being born in a garage makes you a motor car. <laughs> you, became a, you became a male by birth, but you become a man by choice. Mm. The acceptance of the response, and we've got so many uh, childish men today, mm. that just never growing up. Uh, Paul talks about it in Timothy. He talks about you know, a, a, a man providing for his family. If he doesn't provide for his family, he's worse than an infidel. That's what mm. it says in Timothy. Well, I can sing, tap, dance, pray in tongues, that's great, but do you provide for your family? Mm. And, and I ask guys that, and they get angry sometimes. Mm. Well, you know, provide, pronoio in Greek for all the Greek students out there. Mm. You know, yes, food on the table, clothes on the back, go, go a little deeper, get your Webster's Dictionary out. It means to actively defend, mm. maybe even lay down your life. Mm. So there's a difference between boyhood and manhood. And so, because we don't understand, I think we have this thing we're stuck in the middle somewhere called teenagers. Mm. Uh, I, I interviewed a young man who was actually in the Brisbane Courier Mail some years ago, Torres Straits. They're out in the boat, the boat sinks. The dad says to the boy, I can't swim the seven kilometres. Stephen, uh, Stephen, I can't think of his other name. Uh, he said, I can't swim the seven kilometres. He said, your responsibility. The dad drowned, the mum drowned. But Stephen swims with his two sisters. Now, he's 13, his sister's 15. He put her on his back, swam some of the kilometres with his sister on his back. Mm -hmm. Saved their lives, kept them alive for two or three days. You know, uh, it was on 60 Minutes, I think, with Ray Martin. I, I rang him and I said, oh, I really admire you. How did you do that? And he said, that's why I was raised up. Mm -hmm. He said, his auntie said that, uh, you know, he's a great example of a Torres Strait man. Not boy, not teenager. He just said, that's why I was brought up. Mm. Acceptance of responsibility. Mm. Well, it's certainly a powerful message that you're bringing to men. And I think uh, lots of blokes need to hear this message you're bringing. Uh, the other messages that you bring, uh, I, c I can see you've got the hat here, mate. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, the 800 Light Horseman yes, sir. Uh, is a, a book that you've written uh, talking about the Aussie uh, light horseman that charged in Beersheba and basically saved Israel. Yes. Uh, an amazing yes. story. Uh, tell us how that all came about. Okay, my, my father sent me a, a family history book, you know, with his, and I thought this would be pretty short. <laughs> you know, when, they, the, when the, uh, what the evolutionists talk about their ancestors swung from the trees, well, mine bit, did, but, but from their necks, not their tails. You know? oh, nice. I thought there's going to be horse thieves. But anyway, I opened it up. Here's a photograph of my grandfather in a light horse uniform, mm. and I know nothing about it. My grandfather broke horses for the light horse, so did Banjo Patterson, mm -hmm. a remount unit. And I'm thinking, my uncle, a three horses shot from underneath him in the battles to liberate the city that Jesus is coming back to. That's not New York, that's Jerusalem. Mm. And I'm thinking, my family's involved in this and I don't know anything about it at all. Thank you for watching History Makers TV. Keep well up, come on! So the British thought they could take Gaza with tanks. They thought they could terrify us. Welcome to Palestine, Captain Reichert. Thank you, sir. The High Command has sent you to congratulate me on my earlier victory in Gaza. News of your triumph arrived after my departure, but I'm sure they would wish me to do so. Of course. But all congratulations are due to the British general, Sir Archibald Murray, for he had captured the town. But he's such a dunderhead, he didn't know, and withdrew his troops. There's little joy in the defeat of an unworthy opponent. I realize why a clever young intelligence officer has been sent here from Berlin, but I bear you no ill will. In fact, I shall suggest the substance of your first report on me. 
General von Kreschenstein is supremely confident that the British will attack Gaza again and again. That he will defeat them again and again. Cavalry captain. They are Australian light horse, mounted infantry. You can tell them by the plumes in their hats. They're formidable soldiers, but the English don't know how to use them. Wait till the light horse dismount, Colonel, then open fire. On the men or the horses, sir? Why, on the men? You don't understand, do you? You have so much to learn about war in the desert, you and General Murray both. See there. entered Gaza during the first battle. Good troops, again wasted. We're fighting in a desert. Warfare in its purest form with one inescapable rule, men and horses must drink. A man can carry his water bottle, travel short distances slowly, and fight while his water lasts. A horse can fill its belly with water, travel long distances quickly, go without water for one or two days, but then must drink huge quantities, enough for 30 men, or die horribly. And each time Gaza is attacked, we hold out for one or two days at most, and the British are defeated by the desert. Colonel, what is happening? Your clever little illusion has reached Beersheba. But what are you doing? The only sane thing. I am surviving. Damn you to hell! Blow up the wells. The demolition officer isn't here, sir. He has the number coding. Then blow up everything, you idiot. What's happened? The artillery fire. It must have broken the wires. Get out and repair them. Yes, sir.
to Australia? Reckon it will, mate. Fair enough. This is the back of roof again. Can you look after him for me, sir? Good work, Trooper. Hands right up there! Get that gun away! Right away! You can understand me, but I'd very much appreciate it if you'd give me the chance to blow your bloody head apart. Easy, man. Get him out of here. Thank you for watching History Makers TV. And so I started to do some study, you know, and really got into it. And, uh, you know, it just started to open up. Uh, you know, the city that Jesus is, well, the foundation of the modern nation of Israel, mm. the, the charge on Beersheba, opened the gateway 31st of October, mm. 1517, the Ottoman Turks, the Muslims captured mm. uh, uh, the wells of Beersheba. It was liberated the same day, 400 years later, to the day, 31st wow. of October, 1917. Mm. If you remember the, uh, the 11 Crusades that tried to take it, Napoleon had sent an army, but in 1917, well, 1914, when we shipped out, we were 13 years old as a nation, the mm. youngest nation in the world, mm. traditionally when boys become men. Mm. But in 1917, when they made the charge on Beersheba, uh, 60,000 British troops with tank support couldn't do it. I feel a love's going to come from the English now. Is that right? <laughs> and I'm not saying they didn't play a part. Of course they did. The Kiwis too. But the actual charge on Beersheba was made by the 4th and the 12th Australian Light Horse. Mm. And they took the wells against the odds of 6 to 1 against them. German machine guns, artillery, but they took the wells. Mm. The night before they made the charge from a military history book, unusual phenomenon in the desert sky, angelic beings, lights appearing. Mm. Uh, they make the charge, they lose 32 men. The gateway to Jerusalem's open, not by the British army, the American army, by our forefathers. Mm. As they, I've got photographs there as the Australian Light Horse ride into Jerusalem. Mm. The Jews grab their boots and kiss their boots. Mm. First army ever in history that's come to liberate us and not enslave us. Mm. It's an amazing story and I was actually over in Israel earlier this year yeah, you with a group of pastors yeah. and I read from your book to the pastors mm. uh, uh, the, a couple of the pages there that explained that battle and uh, I'm taking another tour to Israel uh, in November 2014 and I um, can't wait to go back there because my great-grandfather was one of the light horse yeah. as well and uh, it's an amazing part of Australian history. Well, mate, um, we do have to wrap it up there but uh, I just want to say, mate, your, your books, uh, Australia's Christian Heritage, uh, The 800 Light Horsemen, uh, a lot of your stuff that you do on radio, uh, on TV, has just impacted so many people. You're a real father in the faith in Australia. 
And uh, just wanted to say, mate, thanks for joining us today. I reckon you're a history maker. Thanks for joining us. you got good taste, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, mate. You're on History Makers TV. We'll have more coming up soon.